It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Chris Nybauer, DDS, FAGD, who was born in Maryland. Chris became fascinated by dentistry at an early age when he lost number eight in a family touch football game. After graduating from dental school, purchasing his own practice, and subsequently selling that practice and most of his belongings, Chris followed a calling to serve as a dental missionary in Cameroon, Africa for five years. It was on this mission where Chris learned the true value of providing legendary patient care and the necessity to provide that care very well and very fast. Chris often had patients lined up around the block for treatment, and if he could not serve them that day, they would have to walk miles back home and return the next day in hopes of being served. This approach of very well, very fast patient-centered dental care practice has proven to be a great differentiator for his company. Years after returning from Africa, Chris founded Nybauer Dental Care, growing from 1 to 26 scratch practices from 2005 to 2011 with $60 million in revenue. The offices were in Virginia and Maryland and grew exponentially during the recession of 2007. In 2011, Chris sold these practices and eventually moved to Park City, Utah, where the winters are full of powder or skiing and the summers are humidity-free. Now he is on a mission in Utah to grow a dental corporation focused on delivering legendary patient care. The new corporation is Abundant Dental Care and is 50 employees strong and growing quickly. What truly is sets Abundant Dental Care apart is two things, their culture and availability to their patients. It's an incredibly consistent culture based on three distinguishing characteristics, elevating dental care, dental professionals to mastery, applying unconditional responsibility to all that they do, and providing legendary patient care. Chris, it is just an honor to have you on this show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you, Howard. And how are you? I'm doing great, man. It's a beautiful Monday morning in Phoenix. You're about uh, what? What is it, Phoenix to Salt Lake? What is that? A 12-hour straight north drive? I believe. Yeah. I, I think the most beautiful drive in the world is from Arizona around the Grand Canyon to Salt Lake and all the way up to Canada. I mean, it's a thousand miles of just unbelievable nature. Well, I've never done that. Have you? Oh, yes. And uh, down here in Phoenix, it's about 10% Canadian. So a lot of the snowbirds, when they come down from Canada, they make that drive. And they always, uh, every year they drive it, they make the drive longer and longer and longer. Instead of trying to hurry up and get home, they just really enjoy that drive. Reading your bio, it's almost like science fiction to grow um, from 2005, 2011, six years, growing 26 scratch practices. How does one even do that? Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of my story so you understand it. Uh, I practiced as a missionary dentist for those five years. And then I came back in 1987, and I still practice as a missionary business guy, which means uh, you don't have any money, Mrs. Jones. Your husband's laid off. Don't worry about it. Get, pay me $5 a month. So all of a sudden, it's 1995. I can't pay myself uh, because of my poor financial arrangements and no business acumen. So the next 10 years, I went on a tear of continuing education study underneath dental, every dental management guru I can find, uh, charged up the credit cards. And from that 10 years of intensive study, uh, the foundation, uh, we just went from one office to another, uh, another office. And what uh, keyed it off was being a missionary where I ran four, cha four chairs with one assistant and learned how to do dentistry very well, very fast. Flash forward, 2004, Waldorf, Maryland. I'm in one office, and we did 4.3 million in 1,500 square feet. So being a missionary set that up. So once I set that up, uh, then the dentist wanted to know how I did it. And all of a sudden, we had plenty of dentists to interview, and the rest, is th the rest is, is, is history. And then what was your exit strategy in 2011? Who, who do you sell 26 offices to? Uh, well, I never really had an exit strategy. I never thought I would sell. Uh, but Heartland approached me about a year and a half before then, about 2010. And I said, no, not yet. And then they made me an offer that I couldn't refuse in 2011. Well, and now you are um, you retired um, back to Utah. Um, were, were you born in Utah? Or how did you get from uh, Maryland to uh Utah. By the way, I don't believe in retirement. I mean, retirement. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, you know, uh, I went to Park City because this is where I want to live in this country. I live at 7,000 feet. I got 20 acres. I got moose. 
bobcats and deer in my front yard. Uh, the hum- I don't have to put fleet dip on the dogs. Uh, no termites, low humidity summers, beautiful skiing. Uh, I came here because this is where I want to live. So, you know, for six, seven years, I did some investments, did some real estates and all that kind of stuff. But I figured out my great love is helping young dental professionals to mastery faster. But it took me 20, 25 years. My mission is to help them to get in five to seven years. Well, we had a dental student uh, who just graduated last week on the show last week, Brian Jankowski, and he's on his way from Mesa, Arizona up to Utah to join your team. Yep. uh, This kid, I believe, is going to be a superstar really quick. Uh, You know, dentists usually don't have superstar mentality, in in my opinion, uh, studying their their traits and their cultures. But there are some born naturals, and I believe he's going to be a rainmaker, serving patients really well, quickly. Yeah, I I agree. So you sold that to Heartland, and now you're starting uh, the Abundant Dental Care. How old is your Abundant Dental Care now? I mean, I know you're already up to 50 employees. How far along are you now? Uh, we're about three employees, uh, three employees, three years in, uh, a little bit more. I started from scratch grass the first time in Navarro Dental Care. I was still practicing, got out of the chair in 2005 when I grew and worked on the business instead of being practicing. This time it was totally scratch. I knew nobody in Utah. Uh, I just loved to go with some place where it's the most difficult place to get something going. <laughs> yeah, and showed that it can be done. And so it's taken a while to get going, but uh, we're hitting about, uh, we did five and a half last year. Uh, We're starting to, what I call is hit our inflection point where we're going to start taking off. I'm already looking at some major acquisitions we're negotiating right now. And uh, you're going to see Nybar on the horizon again in dental corporations in the next five, five, seven years. I'm the kind of guy that does his own thing and nobody knows about so will you, are you planning on the same exit strategy with Pat Bauer and Rick Workman of Heartland when, uh, when after uh, Abundant Dental Care is created? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not thinking of anything like that. I'm thinking of a billion dollars, baby. A billion dollars? A billion dollar corporation, next 15, 20 years. And so to be a billion dollar corporation, how many, um, how many offices and dentists, wh- what, what does that look like to you? Uh, 200 offices. Uh, 200 offices at $2 million a piece with 20% profit. That throws off $80 million in revenue. You get a multiple of 12 and a half. All of a sudden, you got a billion-dollar valuation. Okay. So two, times 2 times 20%, you got $80 million thrown off. You got 12 and a half EBITDA. You got a billion-dollar corporation. So that that's the uh, – who knows whether it's going to be 200 or 400, but that just gives you an idea how, how it can be done. Okay, say that say that again. So, two hundred offices doing two million per year, uh, doing twenty percent profit, throws off eighty million dollars profit or EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, at that level, you get a multiple probably like twelve and a half, and also you got uh, you got the big B. Warren Buffett uh, doesn't like the word EBITDA. Um, what what do you think of Warren Buffett's quotes on EBITDA? You know, uh, Warren Buffett is far smarter than I am because he's worth $67 billion. So maybe I need to study some more what uh, Warren Buffett thinks. Uh, that was just a quick calculation to, you know, to find out what the enterprise could be worth. Warren Buffett is well known for disliking EBITDA, E-B-I-T-D-A, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, uh, multiples to value business financial performance. Um, he is, um, let me see if I can, uh, um, why does Warren Buffett dislike EBITDA? Um, EBITDA stands for earning, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization is one of many indicators of a company's financial performance. However, it excludes depreciation and amortization on the basis that they are not cash items. Depreciate amortization are also a measure of what the country is spending or needs. Um, so, so, you know, I guess uh, Warren Buffett says, and I quote, 
It amazes me how widespread the use of EBITDA has become. People try to dress up financial statements with it. We won't buy into companies where somebody's talking about EBITDA. If you look at all companies and split them into companies that use EBITDA as a metric and those that don't, I suspect you'll find a lot more fraud in the former group. Look at companies like Walmart, G, and Microsoft. They never use EBITDA in their annual report. But the reason I'm focusing on EBITDA is the fact that um, it's a interesting phenomena where if you sell one office to a DSO, you might get a multiple of four, but you sell 100 offices, you might get a multiple of like you say 12. Why? You, um, so it's just more proof of concept. Um, one office might have some variables that might not be scalable, but by the time you got 10 or 20 or 200, it looks like it's very, uh, the business model is correct. Yes, and usually, usually when you buy one or two offices, it's somewhere between 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 uh, of their annual re uh, previous annual revenue. So uh, that's the guideline. You don't get into multiples until you get multiple offices usually. Okay, so what um, what will your business model be? I mean, it, um, you know, everybody wants to be unique. Um, everybody wants to have a unique selling proposition. What will be unique about abundant dental care um, on their business model? I thought you would never ask. <laughs> Went through a lot of BS to get to the main thing. How hard where do we go? Okay, so uh, same thing as far as the business side, and then we're going to go what I call the spiritual side. And don't get worried about spiritual. It doesn't mean dog, but it only means serving others. Don't go get worried about it. It only means serving others better. So let's go to the usual thing. Open seven days a week. How soon can you get here? We take your insurance. We say yes to the, the patient. Uh, those kind of things. Sense of urgency. We'll get you in. We'll get you in now. I'll work expanded hours. I'll work up, open up seven days a week because teeth do not have a schedule. And so I believe the corporation that does that will always have a differentiator in the marketplace. Doing what the customer wants instead of what the doctor wants, or the doctor wants your schedule, or however uh, people want to uh, serve others. But that's what I learned as being a missionary. When you're a missionary, I was making far less than when I was a regular dentist, but I was there for service to others. So it, was, it gives you a mission, it gives you intensity and a focus to serve other human beings. And just that, patients understand that and feel that. And so that's the great differentiator in the marketplace, along with part B. That was part A. Part B is uh, dental students are coming out of dental school $500,000 in debt, three or $400,000 in debt. They've done two or three root canals. They've done a few crowns. They really haven't. Uh, society has failed them in education. What a patient wants when, you, when they sit in a chair, they want some doctors done 1,000 root canals. That's what they want. So we have when I call about elevating dental professionals to mastery, we have a system in our corporation where uh, a dental student comes out and say, you're a class one dentist. You can do single canals. You can do a few crowns. You can do uh, some fillings. And then we'll require them to get uh, continue education. The uh, classic way to do it is just get your FAGD, MAGD, get your 500,000 hours in. And we have hands-on training with our dentists, just like I did many dentists at Niva Dental Care. And obviously, from those numbers, it worked. From Niva Dental Care, it worked. And so we're having young professionals like Brian that you mentioned that want to learn very fast, get to become actual masters. L.D. Pankey says that only 2% of dentists become master dentists. So uh, our game is to take dental students who really weren't taught very well according to what a public would want, a patient would want, and get them to mastery, uh, get them to the level uh, they can take out 90% of uh, teeth. They can do 80% of uh, root canal, molar root canals. They can do root canal core crown in an hour and a half on a molar. They can prep 14 teeth and get an impression and make it temporary in two, two and a half hours. The kind of things that have done very well and very fast that – uh, they are not held accountable. So the doctors that ha hire with us, they buy into, they love feedback. They love accountability because we cannot see ourselves as, as other people see us. And when other people give us spontaneous feedback, 
then we know that we're on our pathway to serving others better as a master dentist. So much, um, so much of what you say is so confirmable. I mean, when you look at um, dental associate, dentist associate turnover, it's a, it's a plague. I mean, not just for DSOs, but for private practice. And a lot of these DSOs, their average uh, associate dentist only stays a year, but the ones that stay the longest are actually at Heartland, which is two years. And that's what the dentists say, that they stayed there so long because they were taking advantage of all the continued education and learning how to place implants or Invisalign, whatever their dreams are, they're, they're learning that. So they're, uh, and that's what every young dentist who, um, we just had, you know, um, dental school, all the dental schools just graduated last week. And when they're coming out, they keep looking myopically at uh, associations just based on how much money they're going to make or what percent they're going to make when they really should be looking at um, what are they going to learn in that time period that they're that they're employed. What they should really be looking at, and I agree 100 percent, is let's get back to the old missionaries of forever. Let's get back to serving another human being our mother, brother, and father, and sister, every human being that sits in our chair. Let's get into service of patients and just not my, I want I want four day work week. I want this much vacation. I, I, you gotta give me this much to eat. You know, when you have, when your purpose, and of course Buddha says your purpose is to find your purpose. And so you're really understanding that I'm really not a, uh, I'm really a missionary heart's tale. You know, this is a mission for me to help young dentists to get it faster to serve more patients better. So where, where does that come from in your life journey? Where, where, where does the sense of uh, purpose and um, treating your fellow man and going to Africa for five years, where, where does that come from? Well, it started from originally, it started from I was raised a strict Seventh-day Adventist. And so the mission trip was uh, serving a Seventh-day Adventist church. I have, in my opinion, far since left that behind and got out of, got out of the religious uh, dogma and sin and guilt and all those kind of things and uh, under, understand a new, like an eclectic philosophy. And of course, what I call that, and I have to, these words trademark, unconditional responsibility. And Carol Dweck, a uh, uh, Stanford psychologist, uh, says that the number one uh, success principle of all successful people is they take full responsibility. So the term unconditional, no effects, affects my responsibility. So you've been around the block. I've heard you through decades. I love what you, your service to dental town and helping uh, dentists get better. We all have various callings to do things in different ways. And so obviously you've been on a mission by what you do. You can call it spiritual, whatever, but how are you been on a mission? I'm on a mission on a different level or a different way. It doesn't matter as long as we're helping dentists to serve better. And and, effect, and we can exponentiate our uh, influence on serving uh, patients better. So unconditional responsibility, you know, you've been around the block with dentists. Uh, it's too many sh uh, patients, uh, too many dentists. Uh, the not, insurance is bad, uh, blah, 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 blah. Well, unconditional responsibility says whatever I have in my life, I have attracted by the person I become. Wow, <laughs> those are profound thoughts. Um, I, I want to go right into it. I want to make one comment first before we go into that. Um, um, your dentists are contracted to do a minimum of 70 plus hours of continued education. This far exceeds the industry requirement of 30 hours every two years. Um, you guys do it all in the name of providing world-class care for your patients. Um I, I have always told these kids on the show that in the 32 years of observing this profession, the dentist who did 100 hours a year and got their FAGD in five years and kept doing another 100 hours a year and got their MAGD for six years, they're all successful by almost any way you measure success. They're happy. They have purpose. They do quality work. Um, they like dentistry. I just There's something about a human picking up advice and knowledge from their colleagues at the rate of, you say, 70. Um, the AGD says, um, you know, it's just that, that is so profound. I mean, that just just do it. If you're not taking 70 to 100 hours of CE a year, um, you're, you're still meeting. But I want to go back to what you were saying about uh, uh, Buddha says your purpose is to find your purpose. 
Um, I've also noticed you're, you said you're open seven days a week. There's only three publicly traded dental offices on earth today. Two are in Australia, one's in Singapore, and they all have the same business model where they're open seven to seven, seven days a week. Now, I believe you're open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, Monday through Thursday, 8 to 2 on Saturday. What, what are your hours on Sunday? Okay, it's 7 to 7, Monday through Friday. And uh, eight to two, we're, but we're getting ready to expand it now. We're getting more dentists on board. So right now it's eight to two on Saturday. Uh, Sunday's twelve to four. Uh, so right now, on, to, wait, on Saturday it's what? Eight to two. And then Sunday is what? Twelve to four. Um, what I don't understand is that every dentist listening to you right now has a loved one or themselves or their family that had to go to the hospital emergency room in the middle of the night from having a baby to having a heart attack, why do you think dentists have never been aware that there's 8 billion humans on the surface and a lot of them are having um, discomfort? I mean, 8.5% of emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin, and they don't even want to acknowledge it. They love living in the box of work-life balance instead of the true... The truth, which I believe is work-life integration, work-life integration. So work-life balance is I became a dentist so I could work four days a week and the patient, uh, I could avoid the phone calls and they can stay in, in pain or whatever, go to the emergency room until Monday. Work-life integration, how it those years when I made my big turnaround at 45 years old when I couldn't pay myself till 55 when I started that dental corporation, I always answered the phone 24-7. And if I got a phone call at 7 p.m. Saturday night, I put the wife, the two kids, uh, the wife swiped the credit card, the kids set up the trays, and I took care of the emergency. We worked together as a family. And do you think that was better uh, modeling the behavior for the young children? By the way, my son, uh, he'd probably be embarrassed by telling this, but he made a million dollars in his single horse dental practice himself on his W-2 form last year. And he's got his MHD. It's just too simple, Howard, just to think differently and outside the box is that this is my box. I don't answer the phone. I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve every nation, kindred and trunk and every human being. If there's one thing the five years of missionary life taught me is service comes first and everything else comes your way. In fact, there's a great book out there that I just love. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It actually changed my life more than any other book besides the Bible, and it's called A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles. I would love for you to grab that book and read it if you've never heard of it. And who wrote this book? Uh, it was Visions to, uh, I believe, some uh, big university psychologist. You'll have to read it. Uh, it's really quite interesting story. It took me a year to read it first time. I didn't understand it. It took me four years to, to uh, finally start understanding it. I study it every day. But what's really interesting about this book is it's not dogma. It's not any uh, woo-woo. It's just it actually teaches you to have no fear in your life. You see, unconditional responsibility teaches you if you have an accident, you attracted that accident. In fact, this is is really hard to, for people to believe, but once you understand it, you can be sick free. Your mind is your all powerful. You are a piece of God. Greater things than these you shall do. And if you have that belief, you don't have to get sick. You don't have to get in accidents. You don't have to attract those. You attract those by your fear. In fact, that good book written 2,000 years ago says, Lo, the very thing I feared came upon me. Quite enlightening, isn't it, Howard? And so when you live that life so free, you attract really great things. Remember, unconditional responsibility says whatever you have in your life, you attract by the person you become. Because, and if you don't like what's in your checkbook balance, if you don't like the relationship, if you don't like the car you drive, you change. And this is just a result, you know, basically uh, me reading 2,000 books over the last 20 years or plus and picking the nuggets that work for me and applying them. Picking the nuggets, you, you know, you go, to, you go to a dental CE, you sit there all day long, they could have given you the, the, the nuggets in the half an hour. 
be a nugget uh, grabber, Howard. That's what I teach young folks. Be a nugget. Get things that work for you and apply them to the workplace and your life. So it's a course in miracles by um, Dr. Shuckman. Helen Shuckman. Um, yep. And um, basically, um, it talks about uh, the psychotherapy, purpose, process, and practice. Um, when you talk about dentistry seven days a week, um, a lot of religions, um, like, like you say you're a seven-day Adventist, they uh, observe Saturday, uh, Christians and Jewish people observe Sunday, Muslims observe Friday. Um, I've seen this repeated business model. I remember, I'll never forget, one of the greatest endodontic practices ever was uh, by a man who uh, was in Manhattan, and it was most of the endodontists were Jewish, and everything was closed on Saturday, and he says, my God... I have to serve my fellow man on Saturday. So he opened up his endodontic practice and soon exploded on Saturdays. And then he had the same problem where the Muslims weren't working endodontists on Friday, the Christians weren't Sunday. And he very um, um, opened up his endodontic practice, again, seven to seven, seven days a week. And when everybody said um, Manhattan didn't need another endodontist, guess who has the largest endodontic practice in Manhattan? Uh, Barry Musicant. I mean, just a yeah. complete genius role model um, of mine. So, yeah, so, I, so how do you, so how do you get these how do you get these um, um, kids to come out and say I'm not working on my religious observed day and and then to, and then set up a a business model where uh, they have to go to the emergency room because there's 160 hours in a week and the dentists in Phoenix are only open Monday through Thursday. Well, the beauty of it is, uh, you got to find people with uh, that are willing to serve others. Is is a religion more important than serving humanity? Is a religion more important than serving humanity? Isn't the basis of all religions is to help humanity have a better life? And so, yes, we, you know, we, uh, in, in this model, we're trying to we're working on being transformational not transactional. You see, when you're transactional, you pay so much and you work so many hours. And so as we attract more philosophies, you know, you'll have, we have people already that want to work weekends. You know, their work week is gonna be Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. And they got three days off every week. So when you have many multiple dentists uh, in a corporation, it works towards the other good. So none of our dentists have to work more than 35 hours or 40 hours a week. Nobody has to be overworked, but the hours are covered. If you can just think differently or outside the box, uh, you can uh, you can you can serve more patients better. Yeah, when you were talking about um, um, purpose, my oldest sister is a uh, Catholic teaching nun or a Catholic nun, and uh, she's read every major religion and um, its original. And uh, she says that the only thing in common of every major religion is serve other people like you want to be treated. The golden rule. She says it's the only thing that shows up in every religious work, unlike the name of a person, place, city, or town. Um, but it's amazing um, how hard it is. The, these dental graduates, they come out and they, they complain that they're $300,000 in debt and they want you to throw them a pity party. And then when you say, well, why don't you work uh, evening till 7 and Saturdays and Sundays, and they're like, I'm not that desperate. And you're saying basically it's a uh, it's an attitude um, that um, they they don't they're not feeling uh, the purpose. Yeah, we're not that we can't hire everybody. You know, we lose tons of uh, candidates because they only work they're in the box. Uh, they don't want to think outside the box. But the ones that uh, really uh, were attracted to dentistry, and there's a lot of good folks in every generation, and there are folks that became a dentist that want to serve other human beings, and they, they can be uh, inspired if they're not a natural, naturally inspired to serve others better. And you know, uh, the first step in getting is giving. A first step in getting is giving, and so when you give your of yourself more than your preconceived ideas to serve another human being, then it's another method of how money just flies into your pocket. It just flies in your pocket instead of trying to live in, you know, that blue ocean book and trying to live in the a red ocean where everybody's competing in the same hours and the same thing instead of living in the bread or blue ocean where the road is wide open on that road to the extra mile.
So the the next thing that um, is so controversial is takes insurance. I mean, um, there's um, I mean, um, there's Medicaid that most dentists don't take. There's PPOs. Um, we've seen the disappearance of indemnity. What's your views on insurance? I love insurance. I am so happy that they have insurance because that just means more people will come. Uh, but we do do PPOs. Uh, we do a lot of free dentistry. Uh, we do, and you know, we use that free dentistry, by the way, uh, when we're taking dentists from class one to class two, class three, we start doing free full mouth reconstruction on, on uh, free dentistry. So we actually have like a business residency here. Uh, you know, doing uh, root canals and things. Uh, so there's a lot of workarounds instead of doing Medicaid or whatever it is, but we do take PPOs. And I have a great positive attitude about P PPOs because they come in. And yes, most patients are what we call crown of the year club. They'll do one, one crown or two crowns a year because that's all insurance will cover. But if you have more people in the chair, you have a more better chance. As L.D. Pankey said in Dawson's book, the ability to take a patient to comprehensive care. Take them from emergency to comprehensive care. So we work a lot on that dirty word in dentistry called sales. The ability to help people to get the work done they need to get done, but they don't want to get done. The ability to help a human being Get the work done. They need to get done, but they don't want to get done. You know how you can go in any dental office in this country, pull out the charts, and you'll see $1 million, $5 million, $10 million of dentistry that needs to be done that was presented that wasn't done. So back in my history, just to give you this little thought, uh, I really started studying sales really hard from 2000 to 2005, probably read a couple hundred sales books and applied it to dentistry. And... Uh, I was working on, I'm an LBI graduate, took all their courses back then, and so I was working on getting a lot of big cases. And so what I learned about big cases is most people can't afford it. And so I'm talking about $5,000 and above, and I was closing about 10% of $5,000 above. In three or four years of intensive study and reading about sales, all of a sudden I was closing 30%. I increased by 300%, but still, of course, 7 out of 10 people can't afford that kind of dentistry. They really can't, and it's okay. We have other methods with associates to take care of them. But you see, by just out-studying, out-hustling, working on emotional intelligence, communication, verbal skills, body language, spending uh, thousands of hours of reading books after books after books to help serve another human being, get the work done that they don't want to get done, but they need to get done. That's what we call about service, working endlessly to get and help them to see that they are worthy of every good thing and they are worthy of taking care of their, their oral health, which is the gateway to, the, to overall health. So what was your quote on selling? Selling is the availability to, what, what did you say exactly? To help people to get the work done, dental work done, that they need to get done, but they don't want to get done. That's that's dentistry 101. All day long, nobody wants to be a dentist. Nobody wants to sit in the chair. And so that's what we, we strive to teach our doctors very well, very fast. Get it done well. That's what I learned being a missionary. And get, it, get them out of the chair. You, we don't have the right to steal somebody's time from them. Nobody has a right, according to Napoleon Hill, to steal anybody's time. And when we make them wait, we're stealing their time. When we have three or four patients in three or four chairs, we're stealing time from them because we can only sit down and work on one patient at one time. Now done. Now done. Now done. And so there's so much uh, philosophy that embroils itself into unconditional responsibility, serving patients better, uh, so giving of yourself before you're expecting something in return. You know, as we, re as we interview these associates, Howard, what happens? What are my hours? I can I work four days? How many new patients are you gonna give me? What's the equipment? Ad nauseum. If I get an interviewee that says, I don't care about that stuff, just let me show you what I can do, that's a Brian Janowski. That's a winner. 
They're like one out of 100 interviews. We have to transform the mentality of society to serve another human being. And that's how everybody wins. That's how we, de that's how we develop abundance, the abundant life. There isn't so much pie that we all have to grab after it. There's more pie for more people. And that's the beauty of growing and, and exponentiating a dental corporation. I'm telling you, 68 years old, I'm so damn young, I can't hardly stand it. <laughs> that, is, that is amazing. I, I want to go back on the detail on um, you take PPO dental insurance. Uh, you do free charity dentistry. Um, but what were your views on Medicaid? We don't take it. But, but why, though? A uh, couple reasons. Uh, it's government control, so this, this is government control. Uh, uh, you know, there's stories out there where a front desk person just made a mistake and they got huge fines as, from fraud. It's too risky, in my opinion. It's too risky. And, uh, you know, uh, people are not held accountable. It's giving them the free. You know, giving people for free, they, they don't. They, they're not going to hold accountable. They don't show up 50% of the time. How can you do a business model when people don't show up 50% of the time when it's free? Uh, you know, I haven't been able to get it to work, but we'll, we'll, we'll serve human beings. We'll yeah. serve human beings. Yeah, what, what you said is a such a structural obvious. It reminds me of gun control. Not You know, I don't want everyone to talk about religion, politics, sex, and violence, but what um, – but when – you can argue facts, but you can't argue how people feel. And with gun control, the reason so many people have guns is because who they actually fear is the government. And you, you just said it in another deal, Medicaid. You know, you uh, mess up with a private insurance company, you have a civil issue. But when you mess up with Medicaid, they're heavy-handed. People go to jail. We've had people on this show that went to jail for years for Medicaid errors. I know a personal dentist that um, left the country and now practices in Mexico because his receptionist was screwing everything up and he realized he was probably going to set the rest of his life in a cage. So if the government wants their people to be less less violent, they have to be less heavy-handed on the, the people. There's a, a big pushback on that. Um, but, but yeah, and then, and then the other thing with Medicaid that you said is so profound is that um, when everything's free, they don't show up um, over half the visits. And the reason Medicare is, um, is so insanely over uh, expensive is because the patient doesn't have a copayment. They, they don't even know how much their knee replacement costs because it's inconceivable to some people that think economics does not exist that if the, if the patient had a 5% copayment or, or just a 10% copayment across the board, the utilization of healthcare uh, would be so much more efficient and competitive and um, prices would come down, volume would go up. Um, it's just amazing how so many people don't do so many um, obvious things. Um, so w when you started out closing 10% of dental cases, $5,000 or more, and then you were able to raise that to 10%, well, what were the key takeaways in a threefold increase of closing big cases? Yeah, it was 10% to 30%. Uh, we set up a whole system. Uh, we had set up a system called the High Needs Patient. Uh, protocol that we have in our corporation uh, where we have it's think of the Rockettes and the Radio uh, City Music Hall where they're always kicking in, in, in uh, their legs at the same time and so we have a whole system from the time the phone call that how the patient identifies themselves as a high needs patient uh, a high needs patient and so how, how a patient uh, identifies himself as a high needs patient is when they call in, they don't say, I need a cleaning, I need a checkup. They said, I broke another tooth, I'm just getting so tired of this. Uh, my daughter's getting married in a few uh, few months, I gotta have a good smile. They say something different. Uh, I think I'm ready for dentures, my teeth are hurting, they're all and they're getting loose. Uh, they, have, they have become, you know, the typical 45 to 85 year olds, where they're uh, you know, they've had MOD, JFK amalgams in their, in their mouth for decades, and they're cracking, they're falling apart. They get to a point where they have to make a decision, I'm going to go all out and do uh, a big case. They don't know what that means. I'm going to get a, a you know, a engine job instead of an oil change. And spend a lot of money either uh, getting implants put in indentures or getting fixed what they got. 
And you have to recognize what in their dental history when they had that crisis and they say certain, certain things. And, you know, as a missionary, uh, you probably heard this. It's out there that if people take care of the dental health, they're going to live 10 years longer. And so uh, we got to be focused on helping uh, people have a better life as they get older. You know, the baby boomers, they get about anything they want. I don't know how many trillions of dollars the 66-year-olds and above have, but they want to look good, eat well. Uh, they want something that, that doesn't come in and out and works good. And by the way, that was just my treatment plan, Howard, uh, in my last few years. <laughs> you know, I want to give you something that looks good, works good, does come in and out. I'm not going to talk about an MO on number two and number five has all this. You know, I'm just going to get to, you know, genius is just making things simple and your confidence in front of the patient. So you said you want the dentistry that looks good and what? Looks good, works good, and doesn't come in and out. There's my whole uh, $10,000 seminar on treatment planning. <laughs> Not quite that simple, but you know that's what they want. That's what everybody wants. Um, so a lot of these, uh, a lot of dentists think that the secret sauce of their business model is in their technology. What What do you think? I mean, um, um, technology can uh, make you do dentistry faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, but it's also very expensive. What cutting edge technology do you believe in? Okay, so I believe in everything dentistry's got. You know, from 3D, uh, I love dentistry. Uh, I love going to shows and passing out my credit card so I can uh, learn more stuff and all that kind of stuff. And then the, usually the, uh, the people behind me uh, cancel my credit cards because I spent so much. <laughs> Just love dentistry. But here it is. Here it is. This is what's missing. Key point. How much do you love that human being in front of you? It's not about transactional. It's not about uh, all the dental gizmos. See, dentists believe if I become the best dentist in the world and uh, they'll come to me and do whatever I tell them. They're only going to come to you if you love them. And you can call it like, or they know that you love that human being in, your, in that dental chair as much as you, it is your mother, brother, father, or sister. In fact, the master, a couple thousand years ago, written about 2,000 years ago, was talking to a bunch of people that they called the multitude, and he said he was uh, helping them have a better life, but when he was talking to them, the greatest business book of all time, in my opinion, and somebody came in the side door, Howard, and they said, don't you know your mother and brother and father are waiting outside here? And the master said, behold, my mother and brother. You see, work-life integration. And there is no work life here and there. Everybody's my mother and brother. And when you really truly have that in your heart and your soul, it oozes and the treatment plans fall. That is so difficult to get people to grasp that concept. But I'm a living embodiment of the results I have in my life by that philosophy. But specifically, is your abundant dental care going to have CAD CAM, CBCT, lasers, all this expensive stuff, or digital scanning, or does any of that expensive uh, technology um, something that you'll be investing in, or do you not find it necessary? Absolutely. We have 3D. Uh, digital scanning we tried uh, with, with CRAC, and it didn't quite work out, uh, but we're constantly on the horizon studying. Uh I'm for, uh, very fortunately, I'm fi uh, financially independent, obviously, when I sold to Hartman. I don't have to do this another day of my life, but I have to do this every day of my life. Then obviously, because I'm on a mission. And so, yes, we'll, we have the latest and greatest. I am a dentist. I love dentistry. We will have what it takes. I We have, you know, we could say Gordon Christensen approved materials. We don't have the cheapest composite. Uh, you know, we have good stuff here. So you're, or, but to be specific, you're saying CAD CAM did not work out well for you. Did it also not work out well for Heartland? I mean, they have a larger sample size of 900 offices. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think they let each, uh, what I remember, they let each doctor decide what they want in their office. I'm not really sure. But it didn't work so, out for you and you won't be doing CAD CAM. We had trouble with the crowns breaking and then not getting the marginal integrity uh, at the level of excellence, in my opinion. 
So no, uh, no one CAD cam. What about digital scanning? We're looking into it right now. My but, son uses it. But you, uh, you don't use impression materials. So um, no, no other major high tech thing that's a part of your business model. I mean, it, would would you say technology is a big part of your business model or not? Or more of a psychological mindset? I have to say neither. You know, we do have three D imaging. We, you know, uh, what do you call those things? Cone beams, yes. uh, because we want excellence in root canal. So I think every root canal needs to be cone beamed. Uh, that's that's what we hold ourselves. You know, we do tons of implants and uh, cone beams. Uh, I believe that's the state of the art now. I believe you're going to open yourself up to uh, lawsuits if you don't have a uh, cone beam. So yes, our office have cone beam. Uh, digital impressions. I've been studying and looking at them for t for years now. And so for those of dentists that really are very well, very fast, it's, a, it's faster to do a, uh, uh, an impression sometimes. But well, I believe it's about to get there. I'm looking at it. I believe it's about to get there. Okay. And then we'll get um, so you like 3D uh, CBCT um, imaging cone beams for um, endo and implants. Um, yeah, we have laser, we have electric hand pieces. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Electric hand pieces. Talk about that. Uh, as opposed to air, I mean, is it all set up electric only, or do you still have uh, the I compressors? Think we both. What's both. that? We got both. But electric hand pieces, you, you know, fits into how to do a four minute crown prep, which I teach our dentists. Uh, how to do that really quick in any dentist who's not doing crown preps in about four minutes. And I'm talking about a crown prep, you will get an A on dental school. And so uh, electric hand pieces have torque. And so they slice through the uh, DEJ like butter. And, you know, back in dental school years ago, and this is 1976, so I've been a dentist 43 years now. And I uh, got done dental school early and, and studying underneath the uh, a, a prosthodontist the last six months, and all I did is crown bridge the last six months. And he said one of the widest words I ever heard was, Chris, let's get the damn enamel off the tooth and quit thinking around. <laughs> so I came with a system with electric hand pieces. Since it has torque, you could you can and uh, follow a system. And of course, in business, we all know. Uh, when some, something isn't working well, it's because the system is is wrong most of the time. People are you generally good if you give them a system and have them do the system. When they refuse to do the system or best practice, you have a problem. But a crown prep, just like a system, and you do a system, you'll get a final result. You'll look up and all of a sudden, lo and behold, I have a really damn good looking crown prep that and our definition of a crown prep is readable margins, enough reduction, and the crown will stay on for 20 years. <laughs> That's our simple definition. Yeah, um, and it's also interesting how um, when you, um, you know, going around the world, it's so uh, interesting because you get to see a, a larger sample size of um, what, what people are doing. And electric hand pieces um, by Cavo are huge in Germany, Austria, um, Liechtenstein. Why do you think uh, in Scandinavia? Why do you think? Um, do you, what what type of electric hand piece do you use? Do you use cable? Cable, I believe. Yeah. So so why do you, why do you why are you so aware of that and the Germans so aware of that, but not the Americans? Mainly because I went to LVI. I went through LVI in like 1995 to 2002. And uh, took all the courses, and they uh, they they taught me electric hand pieces. And you know, in other words, I dropped the hundred fifty two hundred thousand at LVI. Uh, I, I self educated when I didn't have the money discharge of the credit cards. By the way, uh, you should self educate no matter what uh, it, it, it achieves success. But uh, you know, old Bill Dickerson electric hand piece all of a sudden zoom zoom zoom. You know, the key there is speed, very well, very fast. And so if you're prepping a full arch of 14 teeth, Howard, the goal is to get it all done, prep, impression, temporary, by registration, in less than two hours or less. In other words, so you do not have to numb the patient again. Patients don't be renumbed. If you can do it very well, 
Well, let's quit, you know, like the average dentist out there, three, six, eight hours of patients in the chair being tortured and being numbed over and over and over again. We talked about, uh, we're still on technology. We talked about um, CAD CAM didn't work out for you. Um, you do like 3D CBCT imaging for root canals and implants, electric hand pieces uh, to prep a tooth in four minutes. Any other technology standouts in your business model that a young child should focus on? Sales. Nothing happens until you sell. You know, yes, you got to do dentistry. That's 50% of it. In fact, a lot of business books said is the scale in whatever you're doing, uh, being a lawyer, is only really 20%. The rest is, is uh, motivating patients to do, motivating clients, motivating uh, employees, anybody to what they naturally don't want to think they would do because, uh, forgive us, uh, Howard, but we're all trained to be middle class. Educational system is made to make us middle class, is not to think beyond middle class thinking. It actually may, makes us to be like slaves to the middle class values. You know, we um, p humans tell themselves stories um, and to justify their their actions. But um, my gosh, we're dentists, and our homies hate selling, and um, they say they they just don't like it. But in reality, I have four children that turned into five grandchildren. If I pass on. And my grandchildren go to you as a dentist and they each have a cavity and you can't convince them to get out their debit card and pay for it. Um, then I think you're not a very good dentist. But the dentist thinks he's a good dentist because she got her FAGD or MAGD and she doesn't realize um, uh, when you don't do the dentistry, you're not a very good dentist. I mean, I mean, and then they talk about dental materials by Gordon Christian, the god of dentistry, who goes to your town every year, Park City, Utah. I've seen him up there several times. And he talks about all these, um, um, the pros and cons of all these different dental materials. But I just want to stand up and scream, will you talk about the how good these materials are, are on the two out of three cavities that are never even prepped? I mean, I'd rather my grandchildren just had the, de the the tooth decay removed and they packed it with ice cream and butter than, um, than just leaving with a whole wad of uh, microbiology, pathology. So how do you get them to focus on the necessity of treatment plan presentation and selling? Well, it's very simple. So we say in business, we manage them up or manage them out. So a culture win. And so how we went from 1 to 26 and went from 4 million to 60 million in 60 years is we created a culture. And a culture in business, see, culture in business, now you're getting into an inspirational culture as compared to a transactional culture. And that's how you really achieve great things in this world. And so the culture is uh, we have to serve another human being by helping them to see that they have to get the work done. And as many hours as you spend, here's the cruel, what people consider the cruelty. I consider it the joy. The cruelty is we go to dental school, we become the dentist, and we take continuing education courses that are all out there that say, uh, this is how you can work two, two days a week, three days a week. And instead of having a big picture of serving uh, human beings better, that you have to study 10, 20, 30,000 hours in helping people to get the work done they need to get done, but they don't want to get done. You got to get those skills in order to, and when you get those skills, unconditional responsibility says you always will be a tremendous success. There's nothing holding you back. It is not the insurance, it's not the government, it's not the dental industry, it's not whether you use this composite or that composite. It's how you help human beings to realize that they need to get this work done. So what is the missionary, you know, the mission thought is? I'm here to serve and whatever it takes, whatever I have to learn, I will learn it. Howard, did you know, you probably don't know, but for most of the last four decades, I get up at 3 and 4 a.m. every day. I go to bed at 7 or, uh, seven or 8. I get eight hours of sleep. I exercise an hour a day. I'm on a mission. I read two hours every morning because I have so much more to learn today. There's so much I don't know. And, and I'm going to learn to the day I die and serve to the day I die in order for other human beings to have a life. 
Ray Dalio. Have you ever heard of Ray Dalio? Absolutely. <laughs> I listened to him an hour yesterday. You know, and in his book, Principles, right in his first paragraph, he says, uh, we're for $18 billion. So anybody who's worth more than me, I know they know a hell of a lot more than I need, need know, and I need to learn from him. But anyhow, he says, I'm nothing but a dumb shit who doesn't know much in accordance with what I need to know. Well, I, you know, that's a humble guy. So it boils down, and we're getting to about an hour right now, but you know what it really boils down to? A lot of things we talked about today, in my opinion, Howard. What's that? Ego. Ego. And A Course in Miracles will teach you how to be egoless. An egoless person... You you know you know an eagle's person because they're just reading all the time. They're studying. You don't have to tell them to get their FAGD or MAGD. They're already doing it. They're already learning it. They will find the pathway to uh, to uh, service to another human being. And uh, maybe if they hear it for the first time, they will they will figure it out. But the biggest deal in life is constant and endless learning. And that's how you, that's the pathway to abundance life. And that's how you will be 17 in your mind, regardless of where, whatever the hell this looks like right now. <laughs> Ray Dalio, Bridgewater CEO and founder, one of the 100 wealthiest persons on earth, uses nearly constant feedback. Most meetings are recorded and made available to everyone at the firm. And I think um, I've always observed that besides um, 100 hours of CE a year, hanging out with the right people, getting the right attitude, um, is the use of dental consultants. I mean, um, the average dental office collects about 780. If they use dental consultants, it's more like 1.2 million. It's about a hundred thousand dollar difference in net income between dentists who have used an in-office consultant versus those that don't. Uh, but I, I think it's just part of they. They don't even want feedback on themselves. I mean. Eight years of college after you took a chemistry exam with 40 questions, uh, you hoped you missed less than four. Uh, but when it comes to um, um, practice management, it's like they don't even want, I, I think they're too embarrassed from their ego to have someone come in and realize this place is um, unorganized. And, um, you know, so how, how do you create a culture where humans, a social animal, um, is open to feedback? I mean, that, that, that's a rare behavior for a sapien. You know, they got to want it. They got to want to grow. And, you know, that's the process of our interviewing. Uh, back to Carol Dweck, she says there's closed-minded people and open-minded people. And we're always looking for open-minded people. Closed-minded people uh, are closed-minded. They want to hear. A majority of dentists, uh, we have a... A communication style test. We we actually can figure out the, the various personality. Most dentists are very pa high patient conformists. They love roles, lo uh, like roles. Then uh, typically in the dental world, uh, dent uh, uh, I don't know if it's majority, but uh, a good amount love to point out the failures of other dentists when they've done the same thing themselves. <laughs> we all screwed up. If we you hadn't practiced dentistry, you hadn't screwed up. And so, you know, I love going to courses where they show their mistakes. I don't want to see all the good stuff. I want to learn from mistakes. I want to learn how, to, you know, to hit it underneath the tree and still get on the green into it. Uh, you know, that's all about learning, you know, doing it, uh, being open. So it's ego, working on your ego and becoming egoless. That's what Ray Dalio says, how he got the uh, $14 billion. And you mentioned about accountability. Uh, you know, accountability, they have accountability. Now, I haven't gone so far as to take meetings, uh, but I'm thinking about it because if Ray Dalio does it and got the $14 billion, well, maybe I want to do it. What do you think? <laughs> um, HR, HR, uh, well, just human interaction in general. I mean, it's, it's the, the greatest part of, of life, and it's the most difficult part of life, whether you're dealing with uh, family, friends, coworkers, patients. Pe people are so complicated. Um, giving up on employees is the easy way out. You said manage your employees up or out. Um, you know, everyone says support your people until you don't. What HR advice would you give to the young graduates? We just had a graduating class come out uh, last weekend. What, what, how could these introverts who only remind me of a scientist in a library, how would you recommend they get trained better in the understanding of people? 
for HR purposes? Well, read books. Read books, you know. Self-education will make you a fortune. Formal education will make you a living. So the formal education, yeah, they can make two, three hundred thousand dollars and not do too, too, too much. But self-education will make you a living. So number one is you got to read the books. You got to read hundreds of books. You got to read thousands of books. If there's one uh, across wealthy people, they have a library in their house. They run tons and tons of books. And so they know what they don't know. They just have to read them. But we direct them to these books. We hold them accountable to read books. We ha And if they don't read books, it's fine. We understand. You're not part of our culture. You're not happy here. Go and find some place you're going to be happy. You see, you can't. Uh, there was an old study about uh, years ago about a, a college in Ohio where they had, you know, uh, co-ed dorms and beer parties and all that kind of stuff the college kids want. And enrollment kept on declining and declining and declining. And then they raised the standards. No more co-eds. You know, study hall time. They raised the standards. So guess what? The, the, the uh, enrollment skyrocketed. People wanted to end. If you want a better life, raise your standards. Raise your standards. And so people got to want a better life. They got to give up middle class thinking the way they've been trained and want to be hungry. Now, I can, I can guarantee you I don't have to keep teaching people hungry, but I'm telling you, I'm starving to death today. What about you, Howard? I love that. I love your quote, uh, um, that Jim Runkle. Formal education will make you a living. Self-education will make you a fortune. Um, it is so. But I but again, a lot of that, their mind has to be ready um, because they they don't want to consult and they don't want to tell anybody what they're doing in their practice because uh, their ego, uh, they're, they're embarrassed by it. And there's something about humble people. I always found it so bizarre that humble people are always um, not sure they know everything and learning more. And then the least educated people, they're just absolutely convinced they know everything. So on society, the people who know nothing are the most vocal and the people who know everything are the least um, at least vocal. So bad information will travel the world 10 times before an educated person will even start uh, to address how insane it is. Um, I, I want to, I can't believe we went over an hour and I, I, I can't let you go until you at least dress unconditional responsibility. Um, where, where, where does that come from? And you mentioned a Jim Rohn quote, and uh, uh, forgive me for mentioning that was his quote, but, you know, Jim uh, Rohn, uh, Tony Robbins studied him when he had nothing. Uh, I studied, read everything, and it's like, in fact, about every uh, motivational guy out there, I've read their books uh, many times and underlined them over and over and over again. Uh, but one thing about Jim Rohn is it all starts with philosophy. When you listen to Jim Rohn, it all starts with personal philosophy, as he called it. And so it was that course that we all avoided in college, you know, and, and studied the previous test so we can still get an A on it, instead of going and understanding that philosophy is where it starts. And, you know, my philosophy is very basically unconditional responsibility is after I have, you know, I have the Koran, I have... Uh, the writings of Ellen G. White. I have Mary at at her bake, Baker. I have uh, the Book of Mormon. Uh, I have Confucius. I read all of those things and am reading it constantly. But one central thing comes out, as we already mentioned, is serving another human being. That's our purpose. We have just decided to make dentistry how we serve human beings. We use dentists. We have decided, you know, you can be a carpenter, you can be a, a plumber or whatever, but we just have decided to serve others. So the basic unconditional responsibility is no blame. Don't make excuses. Just what can I do? What can I learn? What solution can I come up with? I'll try this. I make a mistake. I'll just correct the mistake. I'll pivot quickly because it didn't uh, make it. Uh, there are no effects in this world that can affect my responsibility. And once we understand that, deceive yourself no longer, as it says in The Course of Miracles, that you are helpless in the fact of what happens to you. 
Anything that you have in your life, you have attracted by the person become. Become a different person and a whole new world opens up for you. Believe that you are part of God and greater things than these you shall do. You are a creator. Every human being is a creation. Every human being sits in your chairs of your mother, brother, father, or sister. Treat them just like that and love them within seconds, a millisecond, just like that. You can choose to do that. And um, you briefly touched on something at the very beginning that you went to Utah, which is um, very, very competitive. So my question to you to these uh, graduates that walked out of dental school, does, do demographics matter? Well, uh, I'm going to prove that it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, I, I, I love running uphill with the wind in my face and the rain pouring in my eyes. I don't want it tough. But, of course, the common thinking is it does matter. I understand. But but is it affecting you? I mean, are you are you going to um, go more rural than urban? Or are you going to, when you open up these 200, I mean, you, what's really neat is, is you have a very defined goal. Um, and your defined goal was 200 offices doing $2 million per year each um, with a 20% profit margin. Um, wh- how will that goal um, be realized in demographics? Are you going to put all 200 offices in uh, Salt Lake City? No, right now we're looking about probably about 12 to 15 here. And then we'll go to Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, is our th- Arizona is our thinking. So you're so you're going to come down to um you're going to come down to Arizona. Yeah, I'm going to open one right next door to you. You. Well, I would love it. Um, I uh, love the <laughs> love the dentist in my neighborhood. I I do. I love it. And, and and back back to that. You um you know they always say when you see exaggerated profits that usually um, capitalists have conspired with the government to restrict competition until they have a cartel. Um. Arizona was the first state that just accept, uh, signed a law that they will accept anyone's professional license. You can move here from any state with a dental degree and be a dentist in Arizona. Do you think, what, what does your macroeconomic mind think that impact will be on Arizona? Well, you know, uh, that's way above my pay grade, Howard. <laughs> but it, it sounded real good, but I love it. Uh, it is called the United States of America, last time I checked. So you get a dental license, it should be for the whole country, in my opinion. Wow. Um, um, yeah, it's uh, competition is so amazing because, you know, is economics a joke to you? I mean, everything they've ever learned in economics is competition is uh, is is huge, and then everybody decides that when they open up their business that they want competition for everyone else in the world's richest country on earth, but not for themselves. And uh, and dentistry has to have more competition when there's not even enough competition to make them open uh, 24 hours a day, like a like a um, um, and I, um, or at least 12 hours a day, seven days a week, so that a person with a broken tooth or an injury or a trauma can be seen right away. But uh, my gosh, go ahead. By the way, Howard, have you read the book Relentless? Relentless? I don't know. Relentless. Who who was that? Anyhow, it talks about coolers and, and closers and cleaners. But uh, uh, you might look at that book really quick. It's written by the uh, uh, physical or the trainer of uh, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, those kind of things. But it has a lot of business analogies. But uh, when you're a cleaner, basically, you don't worry about the competition. The competition worries about you. So obviously what you just stated was I never worry about the competition. I don't know anybody. I'm always working on our game. I'm always working on our game. And that's what I did in Auburn. I don't care. And, they, uh, you know, I got reports that, that back in those days, the dentists were worried when we were put in an office next to them because we are open all those hours. I don't know we're worried about the competition. I only work on how to serve another human being better. And so you're right. When you get an organization that makes numbers, and by the way, when I came to Waldorf, Maryland in 1987, they told me, don't come here, Chris, there's too many dentists. And I blew it up. I blew it up because of my philosophy right there in, uh, in the wrong side of the tracks in the Washington, D.C. area. Well, So it's always about work. You know, worried about, don't worry about all the things, worry about serving another human being better. 
Yes. Um, profound words. Um, it was uh, an honor that you came on the show today to talk to my homies. Um, I, uh, You shared so many great pearls and wisdom. I can't wait till you get down uh, to Arizona. And the next time you're in town, uh, you, me, and Brian Jankowski, uh, we got to go eat a fat, greasy cheeseburger. Oh, I, I'm a keto man. So, yeah, I eat fat, greasy. Uh, I just don't eat all those sweets. <laughs>